Excellent. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we have the joy of having um, Bishop Sally Dick with us. Bishop Dick is the current ecumenical officer for the Council of Bishops. And today, she is with us to talk about the recent general conference held in Charlotte, North Carolina, with uh, some special attention given to the ecumenical and interreligious work that we have done in Charlotte. Uh, we anticipate that there will be some time for questions at the end of her presentation. So I would invite you to um, either put those into the chat or to make note of those as they come up uh, so that we can have some conversation at the end. So welcome, Bishop Dick. We are glad that you are with us. Thank you. And because there's so few of us, we might want to even have some um, conversation uh, even as we go along, but we do want to hold the time uh, closely. Um, the general conference, I think some of you were there. How many of you were actually there? Yeah, um, a number of you. And it was um, an interesting general conference from the perspective of ecumenism and interreligious um, relations. Uh, some of the things um, that um, that happened, I think, are obvious when we uh, got rid of the restrictions and limitations um, on LGBTQ clergy and marriages that both um, encourage some of our ecumenical partners in their relationships with us and also um, brought some concern to some of our ecumenical partners. Um, well, I'll talk more about the Episcopal um, uh, uh, full communion legislation and results, but um, the Episcopalians were delighted. They wanted us to be a church that was open to all people. The ELCAs have put up with us in our less than fully inclusive um, state of affairs. Uh, but it, uh, one thing that, you know, is not as obvious is um, I immediately got um, an an email from uh, an, a writer for the Catholic uh, press and um, they're going like, so how can we work together on human rights uh, now that you have, um, you know, made your, the church has become more inclusive. Um, the Catholic church is not gonna become more inclusive. So how can we work on human rights? Well, I think she probably just wanted to clarify this for people, I, I hope, um, because, you know, it was an opportunity to say, you know, every time we work with our ecumenical and interreligious partners, it's all on human rights, or we go to the Hill, or we make statements or whatever, it's always based on what do we hold in common. And, you know, I just remember when I was the resident bishop in Minnesota, we would spend, um, people would spend months determining which legislative items we would press the legislators on, on our day on the Hill. And we didn't, we didn't work on other things that we couldn't all agree on. And, you know, usually those things, as with the Catholic Church, has to do, they have to do with the um, um, anti-racism, um, uh, eliminating poverty, um, uh, voting rights, those kinds of things. We're all in on those. We have so many things in common. We have never worked on women's ordination or women's rights issues or reproductive health issues. We don't because we know that we have totally different perspectives on those. So um, LGBTQ uh uh, rights and uh, how our churches uh, view that is just there. It's just one of those things that we don't hold in common. And frankly, that's okay. So their article eventually kind of, um, you know, just talked about that. And, and I'm hoping it was just an educational way to remind people how it is that we do work together uh, collaboratively. I mentioned the Episcopal church and um you know, we approved full communion with the Episcopal Church. It was clear to everybody that the Episcopal Church, um, they're having their assembly this summer, but they said, you know, we need to know who it is we're going to be in relationship with. 
And so we're not gonna vote on it this summer, but we think that we'll have a, a, a petition that is encouraging of the process and you know, we'll all vote in um, 2027. Well, um, when we approved sacramental rights for deacons, the Episcopalians were not happy. And um, they just sent Gene a, a, a copy of their legislation. I haven't had a chance to read it, but Gene's comment was, um, here it is, and it's not as encouraging as I would have liked. They're calling for more dialogue. Well, okay, but I thought after we approved both the, I mean, I'd had this hope that after we approved both um, full communion and full inclusion, that maybe they would even reconsider the summer and move forward. Like I figured we had maybe a 25% chance. Well, we need more, we need more dialogue. So that group has more work to be done. Um, and actually um, in the meetings that they've had, it reveals, you know, they still get stuck on um, apostolic succession and um, you know, there's nothing we can do about that, but we had made an agreement. Um, and they also, you know, they've worked out in the past, what about local pastors who had limited um, sacramental rights? You would never appoint a local pastor to a church that is connected with the Episcopalians. Likewise, it would need to be clear to deacons um, that they they couldn't uh, have they don't have uh, sacramental rights um, in an ecumenical um, context with the Episcopalian Church. There are still parameters around those things, and hopefully, if we have a chance, and um, we will have a chance um, when we have a chance to talk with the Episcopalian Church we are dialogue group that will get back on track and that'll go forward. I had so hoped um, that, you know, before 2027, we would be able to move forward because then all, then four denominations can really have dialogue groups and continue discussions together, which would be a wonderful, um, creative um, synergy as well as as mentioned about these other meetings it, it would save money um, instead of going to all these different dialogue groups so it'll happen I'm really pretty sure it's going to happen any questions about these two the Catholic Church and the Episcopalian Church particularly around the Episcopalian Church because it kind of overlaps two things that happened at, at general conference no, yes go, joyce go ahead joyce but yeah i'm just wondering you Ed, when you're speaking about the episcopalians do they have also concerns that we didn't perhaps more forthrightly come out with a full-throated acceptance of lgbtq rights but kind of left it to each church was that of concern for for them i don't think so some i mean I think it was our limit, our restrictions that bothered them. Mm -hmm. And I think they by and large understood why we couldn't have a full out um, affirmation and that that's how we were gonna get through this, this time. Um, so I didn't get the sense. I really do think it just, it kind of scared up the other um, objections about who we are and that became even more of an issue in the meeting following general conference than, than even the sacramental rights of deacons, I think. But we'll have to, we'll have to make them feel comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to do some educating. I think we'll have to do some educating around um, what sacramental rights for deacons means and what it doesn't mean. Um, Katie or Chris, did one of you have your hand up? Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to have to do some education for United Methodists around what sacramental rights for deacons mean as well, right? So it's not surprising that we will for um, 
the Episcopal Church as well. Um, my sense in talking with um, some of the um, members on the um, standing committee that was working on legislation for the Episcopalians for this summer is that um, the legislation that they're putting forward um, in their mind is not a negative thing. It's a positive thing in that they're calling for further dialogue to start to work on the um, documents that that will talk about the orderly exchange of ministers. And so that is work that needs to be done before we would be able to do that anyway. So I think in their mind, that committee thinks that it's a positive thing in we can do that work ahead of their vote in 27. But, um, but it definitely does mean more dialogue is being called for when we thought that we were already finished with that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's on it's on track, you know. Um, just takes a while, and uh, it just it takes it takes longer than you think it should. You know, you look at the at how many years it took any of these um, relationships to come to some agreement, and you're just like, really? But when you're considering general conferences and and assemblies, depending on what the church is, you know, they don't happen all the time, so it does just keep making it longer and longer. Um, okay, and then um, one of the other questions I was asked about, and I'm not sure I've figured it all out. Well, I know I haven't figured it out, and that's regionalization. And um, how will regionalization affect our ecumenical witness and work? I, I think, um, well, my hope would be that it will allow the United Methodist Church to uh, strengthen its ecumenical relationships in other parts of the world besides the United States. Uh, the ecumenical staff and I have worked hard at Council of Bishops meeting to highlight the ways in which our bishops in Africa and Europe have been ecumenically engaged. And in many respects, they have been our best friends, those, those bishops in Europe and Africa, in terms of the importance of ecumenism. In Africa, it's often, especially around the 13th parallel, it's often these ecumenical groups, regional groups, uh, like we would say the National Council of Churches, that provide legitimacy for Christianity in the midst of a very um, interreligious, shall we say, context. And in Europe, um, Christianity is such a minority, and usually the state church is the majority of the minority, so that they've been working ecumenically for a long time and recognize the strength of ecumenism and they're kind of our future. I think they they show us um, ways that we well, won't be identical, but they show us the ways that we will be in the future. Uh, one of the things when I came in as the ecumenical officer, due to budgets and stuff, and because there we at that point didn't have avenues to support these other regional council of churches. The budget for regional council of churches in other parts of the world, besides the National Council of Churches in the United States, um, was put at zero. I think that will have to change, and I think it will be. Uh, I think that'll be a big witness um, when we begin to give money as a United Methodist Church to these regional councils of churches. Now, there's probably other ways, and maybe some of you have ideas about how regionalization will impact ecumenism, but I actually think it will strengthen it and make it more uh, visible to everybody. Does, any, does anybody have any questions about that or comments about how regionalization is gonna affect ecumenism? There's been some spin that regionalization is not, um, honoring or is more exclusive to say our African brothers and sisters. I know that that's not neither the intent nor the 
the probably the the way that it's going to unfold but do you have any reaction to that it, say it again the they're saying that is... the regionalization is making us a less inclusive because we're trying to do our own thing which is exactly the i think the opposite of the intent of regionalization but that's some of the spin that i've heard from the fray yeah okay yeah sure um and i thought you were saying something else um you know it's all going to be proof is going to be in the pudding and um, I certainly hope that that's not the case, but I think the history of autonomous churches um, scares people uh, uh, and probably should sober all of us about regionalization so that um, we do keep being a connectional church. Um, and money will be a great connector, um, which you know, was not a connector with um, the autonomous churches. Individual annual conferences may have given um, to any of these autonomous churches, particularly in Latin America, but, and, and then increasingly to Africa. But, um, you know, I, I think we have to be careful about that. Um, I don't buy it, um, but I, I, know, I think we need to just, always have our eye on that. So it's a good thing to, you know, just raise. Anything else about regionalization? I kind of wonder if it, if regionalization will free us up to do um, broader ecumenical work because, um, you know, the, the ecumenical work that, um, that is happening in Africa um, with Pentecostal churches and um, evangelical churches looks different than what it looks like here in the United States and much of the ecumenical work that we're doing in the United States. So my hope is that it will it will give us um, more avenues into that work. But like you said, right, we have to wait and see what, what happens, exactly. how we live into exactly. it. Yeah, I mean, it's um, some of these very much more evangelical Pentecostal churches that are very eager to join the World Council of Churches, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, I think one of the things that I personally was just delighted about was that Dr. Jerry Pile was able to be the preacher. Um, and, um, uh, and, and just, and he came early. Um, he left shortly after he preached, but he came several days early. He interacted with the Latin American, um, there was a dinner uh, and he went to that and he interacted with all kinds of people. And I, I like I said in my thank you note, it was like, I think, you know, this was certainly, um, you know, a, a, a one stop uh, for any number of relationship building um, opportunities. And most of all, I hope that it helped um, the United Methodist Church have a different image of what the World Council of Churches is. Um, so uh, I'm glad for that. Um, let's see how we're we doing. Oh, we're doing pretty well. Um, let me answer your question, Katie. Um, can you share more about the next steps for the sent in love document? Perhaps because so many other consequential decisions were made without debate. I was surprised the approval of sent in love was debated at all, much less than voted against. <laughs> There's a couple of things that were voted against. One was to put the Nicene Creed in uh, the articles, um, which is a little awkward. The Euro Europeans were not pleased with this. Uh, what does it say if when your church won't accept the Nicene Creed? And of course, in the 1700th anniversary, which is big in Europe um, and uh, like Turkey, uh, and then sent in love was sent back without being approved. Uh, you know, and when they were talking about that, some of the bishops around me was like, well, what do you think? I was like, you know, I'm not totally sure how I would vote. If I were voting, I think I would approve it and then perfect it. But I think there were arguments on both sides and faith and order will need to do some work and it'll give the opportunity to um, really bring it up bring it up to 2024, you know what I mean? Because I remember 
the last time I read it before the legislation, I'm like, this is out of date already when it was submitted. And um, I think that will be helpful. However, and this is, I'm being very candid. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of faith and order having to do all this work. And then the church and particularly the council of bishops just ignores it. So I have been put on faith and order. And um, that's going to be one of my, um, one of my uh, things that I want to watch out for. I think we should have more say in some of these things, like for instance, the full sacramental rights for deacons. Not that you wouldn't have voted that way, but it might've been helpful to have um, some kind of theological undergirding to that. And so we're also recommending that's, that there be uh, faith and order representation on the new iteration of the ministry study. We need to become more theological, not in opposition to justice or I don't know, whatever you want to call it, but just actually to undergird uh, it in a little different way. Um, one other thing I want to um, just mention, which I, I'm not sure people um, really had the opportunity. It went by me anyway. Well, that doesn't mean much, but, um, and that is the, um, the, um, the legislation that was passed, and I'm, I'm guessing it was on a consent count calendar that condemned uh, Hindu nationalism. And um, Neil Christie has an opinion piece in the religion, religious news service, not the United Methodist Religious News Service, but the religious news service today. And you might wanna read that. Some of us signed a thing um, a week or a couple of weeks ago uh, to support you know, um, support asking the president, et cetera, to, to be very mindful of this Hindu nationalism. And of course, Hindu nationalism is like Christian nationalism. It is not the best of its religion. And um, in, India is one of the places that um, has a great deal of persecution and we need to be very careful about, um, you know, our support um, making sure that we are supportive of Christians in uh, India. Uh, I think some of the other resolutions that were in the book of resolutions were continued. And um, I just think some of them are really good, particularly around Muslim relations and also um, witness and neighbor. I, I have used that so much in interreligious um, work. And it usually just some of the things that are in there go down really well in interreligious uh, conversations. All right, um, do you have some other questions? Oh, thank you for um, putting in the Religious News Service connection so that you can look at Neil Christie's article. I think it's helpful to be a little bit informed about it. Mm. You know, with general conference and consent calendars, stuff like that happens and you're like, what? Um, or maybe you weren't, but I was. Any questions? Well, it's amazing. You know, um, we had general conference and there were days when I'd say, well, that was a pretty good day. Words I had never said at a general conference before. And uh, it's just a great celebration, it really is. And that we could be basically kind to each other. That's what was really amazing to me. So I feel good. I feel good about being a United Methodist. Indeed. All right, then um, our, witching, our witching hour has come. Thank you all for being on this You Might. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to see you all again um, sometime.